Um, I'm Philip Schubert. I'm a static analysis researcher at Paderborn University. And at the end of this talk, you should be able to implement your own static analyses using LLVM. And also, you should be able to develop your own optimizations, believe it or not. So let's see how that works out. But first of all, who is that Philip Schubert guy? And why am I here, actually? So um, this is Bielefeld University, the university of the city of Bielefeld, the city that doesn't exist for the German friends here. International people maybe have already heard about that, otherwise ask your German colleagues. But um, anyhow, this is the place where I got spoiled. Because a few years ago, I studied bioinformatics. And the algorithms involved in solving bioinformatical problems typically have a very bad asymptotical runtime. So you have O of n squared on a good day, and typically it's much worse, right? So that means it's hugely important to craft a really optimal implementation of your algorithm to really squeeze out the last bits of your processor, right? And what language can be used to achieve that? You're right, it's not C++, it's C. <laughs> Uh, because that's the language I learned in our operating systems course. It's still the case that in, at most universities there are no C++ courses, and we should probably try to change that in the future. And um, so I implemented a project for my master's uh, thesis in, in C, and it really worked out. And uh, yeah, I now uh, now C, right? And uh, but I thought, okay, there had to be more, right? And then. I saw all your crazy videos on meeting CPP YouTube channel and CPPCon's YouTube channel and all that good stuff. And then I got interested and excited about C++, which is why I started a PhD on static program analysis, mostly for C and C++, really. So today we are going to talk about compilers and static analysis, because this is really where the fun begins. This is all the hard and difficult bits here, really. So by show of hands, who has this book at home? All right. By show of hands, who of you uses the Clang compiler in your daily software development? Clang format? Clang tidy? Clang static analyzer? OK. That should be a bit more, because it's free, it's open source, it's out there. Go try and check it out. But anyhow, if you read that book, you will notice that static data flow analysis is only a small part of one chapter. So for compiler guys, yeah, data flow analysis is a thing. We need to use it in order to find some interesting program properties, which we can then use to build some cool optimizations, right? And here you see on the shoulder plate here, it even says data flow analysis. So this will be uh, a major topic of this talk. So why static analysis, you may ask? OK, let's have a look on applications and techniques. Of course, we have compilers, right? Compute interesting properties to build cool optimizations to make your program run faster. Bug finding nowadays, right? That's also a huge thing. Vulnerability detection, finding syntax violations, or even detecting uh, violations of coding standards by tools of, uh, like Clang Tidy, for instance, right? How can we achieve that? We have multiple techniques in static program analysis. We have abstract interpretation. We have pattern matching, for instance. That's what Clang Tidy uses for the most parts, right? So uh, it builds the AST of your compilation unit. Then using um, uh, matchers, you can specify um, AST patterns that, that then the tool finds on your AST of the compilation unit. And then this may find or help finding code smells and bugs and potentially also vulnerabilities. You have type and effect systems, right? You all know and love it. In C++, you can really use the type system and make it a type safe language if you wish to use it in that way. Whereas in C, for the most parts, if you declare a variable as an integer variable, you mainly say, OK, I want four bytes of memory on most modern, modern machines, at least. <clears throat> Proof systems, I won't go into details about that. Um, symbolic execution, that's what the Clang Static Analyzer implements. That's a technique that analyzes all program paths uh, of your program. Yeah, path by path, really, can be a bit on the expensive side. So that's why it's typically only really used 
for individual compilation units and not whole program. Although it could be used for whole program as well, but it will mostly never terminate, really. And then we have data flow analysis. That's, uh, again, the main topic of this talk. So as you can see, static analysis is really useful for a lot of things, right? So and uh, in this talk, I'll try to show you. So but, but what does it do, right? How does it work? So in static program analysis, it's most of the times exactly like that. So you have your program P that you wish to analyze. And for that program P, you wish to find an interesting property, right? That can be a sign that indicates a bug, right? So a certain variable may be null, a null pointer, right? So you could also have as a property a certain variable at a certain point in your program carries some sensitive material that you don't to, uh, wish to have leaked to the outside world, and properties like that. And then you have an analysis which aims at exactly that. It tries to show that the property phi holds at some statement of your program P, right? That's the idea. And here have a corresponding picture such that you never forget this idea here, really. Uh, that's how you put it together, right? So for bug detection, there's a recipe for compile optimization. It looks a bit different, but let me talk about bug detection here. So first of all, of course, you need to find and understand a bug that you're interested in and that you wish to find in an automated manner, right? You can only really um, find what you're looking for using static analysis, unless you have some implementation flaws in your static analysis, of course. And then what you do is you write an analysis that finds that kind of bug, and then you run the analysis. And if it's a bug or vulnerability, you fix it as a developer. Otherwise, you need to improve the analysis, probably, right? And how come for bug findings that we need to check manually the findings and then uh, take action and, and fix it if it's a vulnerability or otherwise improve the analysis. We'll come back to that later. Because in compiler optimizations, you don't do that, right? So you run your optimizations in an automated manner, and you don't wish to check if the optimization produced the right results. So we'll come back to that while that is. So how it works is you pass your function that you wish to analyze, you build the control flow of that function, and then you conduct the analysis on that control flow graph in an intra-procedural setting, if you wish to analyze only one function at a time. In a whole program analysis, of course, you would pass the whole program. You would build an inter-procedural control flow graph, that is, a control flow graph with additional core graph information, and then you would conduct your analysis on the ICFG, the inter-procedural control flow graph. So, but in the intra-procedural case where you only wish to analyze one function at a time, how could you do it? So, let's talk data flow analysis 101. Let's talk about the, the monotone framework, which has been available since, yeah, almost forever, at least for decades, right? So, how does it work? So, the essential idea that you have to get right, and then you really know what's going on, is the following. You have your data flow facts D, that encode the property you're really interested in, right? Can be what variables carry constant values, what variables may be tainted that should not leak to the outside world because they um, contain sensitive material potentially. So that is data flow facts of interest. And then what you do is you capture the interactions of the instructions of your target program or target function with the data flow facts that essentially describe the properties you're interested in of the program state here, right? And you do that by applying flow functions. A flow function describes how an instruction interacts with data flow facts. And as a result, a flow function will give you a modified set of data flow facts or potentially modified set of data flow facts, D prime. And this is the whole idea. And if you write your own analyses, um, you need to implement the flow functions. You, as an analysis writer, really need to implement the flow functions and describe what are the individual effects of the individual instructions of your program. And this is then sometimes also called environment, right? So you have an input set and an output set. You have an instruction, and you have a flow function that says what the instruction does to your uh, facts of interest, right? And that's 
pretty much all you need to know. Um, the rest can be solved by uh, generic data flow solvers. You just need to understand this. So let's have an example. Let's conduct a constant propagation to perform some optimization. Constant propagation, of course, aims at finding constant variables and, their, uh, and the values that they're currently carrying at, at a certain point in the program. So this should be your target program, and I hope the font size is large enough, but I believe so. Um, uh, so the first thing, as I already mentioned, is we construct a control flow graph here, right? So that's pretty simple here, right? And then what we do is we propagate what we are interested in, and we are interested in constant variables and the values they are currently carrying. At the beginning, we don't know anything about the program, right? Because we didn't look at any statement or any instruction just yet. And then basically what the underlying solver of the monotone framework does, it, it now checks out each and every statement and applies the flow function that describes what this instruction does to our um, data flow facts of interest. And so the solver looks at the first statement and what does it see? So we now play flow function here, right? So what happens? We declare an integer variable x which we initialize to 42. That means no matter what we now before that instruction, we now after that instruction, um, we have a constant integer variable x and it, it carries the value 42. So we add that to our set of data flow facts. And then we can continue propagating those sets through the control flow graph. We check out the next instruction and same thing, right? We declare a variable y, we initialize it to 13 and we now, okay, no matter what holds before that statement, after that statement, we definitely know that y is constant and carries the value of 13. And x isn't modified here by that statement at all, so we just keep it as identity, right? And then an interesting thing happens. I mean, you know, static analysis called static happens at compile time, so we can't really evaluate the predicates of branch instructions, right, of that if here. So static analysis just assumes that both branches can be taken at the same time, so to say. <clears throat> so we propagate the information along both branches here. And then we capture the uh, effects of the other statements here, like this addition here. We also, like, uh, we capture that. And we also have here another assignment. And we also capture that here in the sets of data flow facts. And then we have another interesting point in the program because here we have a control flow merge point. And in contrast to symbolic execution, which really analyzes path by path on their own, um, static data flow analysis merges early. So at this control flow merge point, static analysis information yeah, must be brought together before we can continue propagating them through the program. And it depends really on, on your analysis, how the merge operation should look like. For a constant propagation, it should be something like a set intersection, I believe, right? Because you want to be sure that a variable is constant along, uh, along both branches, really. Otherwise, you don't wish to perform an optimization, I believe. I think that is only reasonable. So let's perform a merge. So x is constant and carries the value of 9043 along both branches, so that stays as is. And for y, it's constant in each branch, but it also carries a different value in each branch. So we need to like, do something about that. And in this case, we just say, OK, we, 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 we say the value of y is then top. And top is, I mean, we have an underlying lattice. I won't go into detail. Details here, it, uh, just this is a pragmatic approach here. But top means can be anything. I can't tell statically, right? And so then I continue propagating it here, and then I'm done in this example. Otherwise, the generic data flow solver of the monotone framework would otherwise use a worklist algorithm, and it would reapply flow functions for each and every statement and instruction unless you have a stable solution and the sets no longer change. And then you have reached your fixed point, and this is your solution. This is the information that you can then use to build an optimization. So what do we now? Um, at the return statement here, return x, we do now x is constant and it carries this value. So maybe let's just, um, let, let's just use it and let's just return the integer literal right away. 
And also we have no other real uses of X which are observable to a user of that program, so we can completely eliminate all the instructions that involve X right away. We still need Y though, because we print it here, and the value cannot be decided statically at this point in the program, so we still need to leave that B. We can, however, um, whoopsie daisy, we can optimize the branching here a bit and make it a bit easier as you see on the right hand side. So that would be a prime example, of course, for data flow analysis. So, but how does it look in LLVM? As most of you are familiar with LLVM. So in static data flow analysis, if you wish to write your own analysis, you don't really want to analyze source code because it's hugely complex typically. You can, if you have a simple task in C++, there is a million ways in which you can solve it, I mean, at least syntactically, and they all boil down to the same thing, essentially. So you don't wish to have that variability here. So you bring it in some different form which you analyze, which is much easier to analyze. And um, what you can use is LLVM's intermediate representation. That's a special compiler representation that the compiler internally uses as a, an analysis target and then it also conducts optimizations on that intermediate representation. And it's much simpler to analyze, really, if you wish to do it in an automated manner. So this is some LLVM IR. In fact, that's the IR for the program I just showed you on the previous slide. So it looks a bit like assembly, but it's still a bit more high level. So we still have functions, uh, such as the main function here, and we have argc and argv. We have some basic blocks here, some entry basic block. We have uh, the if branch, the else branch, and then the, the final basic block. And as you can see, we have different instructions doing different things, right? So we have at the beginning some alloca instructions which just allocate stack memory. So you can think of an alloca as just a variable declaration. Then we have store instructions which store values to memory locations. Then we have load instructions which retrieve values from memory locations. We have comparisons, we have conditional jumps as you can see here. And then we also have unconditional jumps and all the good stuff. And we have function calls. Hey, that would be the C out overloaded left shift thingy, right? So probably should have used print or something, right? But uh, this is how it looks like. And also you can see here that the compiler is not really, the compiler doesn't know member functions. Everything is transformed into free functions where the first parameter is the, the this pointer basically, which is also why you pass the global variable here, the C out variable as the first parameter. Um, anyway, so this is what we analyze because we only have, I mean, by now LLVM only has like 65 different instructions and most of them are really irrelevant for day-to-day for -day analyses, right? So you just need to analyze some few instruction types here. If you wish to check out the LLVM MIR for your own program or compilation units, you can just produce it using dash uh, LLVM, emit LLVM dash S, and then it will show you. Or you could also use just Compiler Explorer, Explorer and choose a Clang compiler and then uh, emit LLVM, emit S uh, also works. And probably you should also use no discard value names because then the compiler tries to keep the original program's value names, variable names as much as possible. Otherwise it was, would just enumerate and come up with names for things. So, and um, yeah, okay, how does it help? So we still need to analyze this intermediate representation now. So LLVM provides APIs for IR inspection, and the types that it provides to do that are built in a highly kind of hierarchical manner. So let me show you. So at the highest level, we kind of have an LLVM context type which does memory management and all the nasty stuff you don't want to see. As a static analysis developer, you don't have to be concerned with what it does, so just believe me, just need to have it, an instance of it, and then it takes care of the difficult bits. Then you have the module type, and you can think of a module, instance of a module, as something that holds the IR for a complete translation unit, for instance. 
that can be then accessed in form of a module. So it carries global values, global variables, it carries functions and all the good stuff. Then for functions, you also, of course, have function types, right? A function in turn comprises basic blocks and instructions. Instructions can use operators. We saw the add, the addition operator on the last slide. And then you also have that special value type. And value is quite interesting because it's located quite, it, it's uh, located very high up in the type hierarchy. So an instruction is a value. A basic block is a value. A function is a value. And this allows you really to write high-level interfaces which accept values as, or pointer to values as parameters, and then wherever necessary, you can obtain the details by casting, casting around. Oh, dynamic casts are expensive, you might say. You may say, but LLVM implements uh, its own closed RTTTI system. Um, and you can then use dynamic cast here, and you give it a pointer, and you give it the target type you're interested in, and then it will return to you either a null pointer if it couldn't be casted, or it gives, it gives you a valid pointer to the now downcasted thingy. And you can also check for is a. Uh, under the hood, it's all integers, right? So each of those types is associated with a special integer value, and then instances of those types carry that integer value, and those dynamic cast checks here and is a check, that's just an integer comparison, so that's very, very cheap. And it's important that this is cheap because we need it for analysis, right? So I'll show you on the next slide. But as I was saying, this allows you really to implement high-level interfaces, so a flow through function, a flow function basically, if you wish to, for whatever reason, implement your own monotone framework, could look like that, right? It receives as a parameter an instruction pointer and an input set, and the result should then be the output set, such that this function describes what the instruction does to your data flow facts. So details when necessary. Um, and this API is so ingenious that it not only allows you code inspection, but also it allows for transformation and code generation even. And we will see that on some slides later on. So it really feels like magic at times, and it's super easy to use. So I, I, I'm not sure what people did before LLVM occurred all of a sudden. <clears throat> so, and with this, in, uh, with, with this information that we now obtained here, nothing stops you from automatically inspect your code. So you can write code like that using LLVM. You just have a simple main. As I was saying, you need that context here, so you need some context variable, and then you can just ask LLVM, please pass me that LLVM IR file, sometimes also called LLVM bit code file, right? And then it will pass it and create a module for that, and it will return to you a unique pointer to that very module. Then it's probably a good idea to verify if that module is all right and nothing got messed up for some reason. You can also check the debug information that may be attached, may or may not be attached to that LLVM IR or bitcode file. And then you can inspect the code really, right? So you can have a bunch of for loops. It's not the best coding style here, but I just want to show some simple example here. So you can just iterate over all functions in that very module. And then you can print the name of the function that you're just looking at. And then for each function, you can iterate the basic blocks, right? And then for each basic block, you can iterate its instructions. And then <clears throat> you can use the RTTI system of LLVM to check what kind of instruction it actually is. So you can ask, OK, is that instruction I'm just looking at, is it an aloca instruction? And if yes, it will give you the pointer to that aloca instruction. Otherwise, it will give you null. And then, I don't know, for show off purposes here, you can just print something. So as you can see, LLVM also has its own like streams, which are better than C out and what we have in the standard. And um, you can also check if, if an instruction is a call base, a function call, so to say. And then you can basically check if it's a direct function call or indirect function call to a pointer, to a function pointer or a virtual member function. So it's really, I mean, it's just a few lines of code and then you can analyze your your own code. And now the question is, is it too good to be true? And if I ask that question, the answer is probably yes. So let's see. Let's have a look at magic initialization. So you can write such code, and if you compile it with any compiler I know, it will throw a warning at you. It will say, okay, you are using the variable i here, 
and it's uninitialized, so please do something about it, right? I hope we can all see that right away. And then you fix your code and write code like that. And then every compiler I know is perfectly fine with that, doesn't report anything. So, um, yeah, why, why is that really? The problem is here, we are messing around with addresses all of a sudden, right? So we are taking i's address and pass it to, a pro, uh, to, a, to another subroutine, to magic init function. Pointers are difficult beasts. I will elaborate on that more in the next few slides. So we need points to information all of a sudden. And also, in order for an analysis to find those issues, it would need to analyze across function boundaries. It would now also need to analyze the magic init function. And while analyzing main, jump into magic init, continue analysis there, and then jump back at some point. And compilers typically don't do that. So no warning. So a realistic analysis requires much more information especially analyses for bug finding or vulnerability detection. You need information on type hierarchy, on type hierarchies. You need information, yeah, on, 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 on points too. Uh, pointer relationships, you need call graph information. And depending on the complexity of your data flow analysis, which you, which you actually wish to solve, you may even need results of other data flow analyses, right? So this example on the right-hand side should showcase that. So here in order, for instance, to resolve that function call to f, I mean, we have multiple implementations of f, we first of all need points to information in order to find that s is actually pointing to an allocated type dupa. And then we would also need the retable information to see, OK, the dupa implementation of f is actually being called here, such that we can give that information to the underlying analysis, right, um, such that it continue continuous analysis in the right implementation of f, right? That would be an indirect function call here. And oh no, he's using a raw pointer. Yeah, just for the simple example here. <laughs> All right, so um, can we do better in practice? So how, how is it done? What would you do to conduct inter-procedural analysis in, in practice? What can you do? Um, I wanted to show to you the IDE framework, the Interprocedural Distributive Environments Framework. That's still considered state of the art, although it's quite some years now in age. So let's see, same program as before, but how does it work in IDE? We also still need the control flow graph uh, for obvious reasons. And now what we are doing is, uh, instead of like propagating sets through the control flow graph, we are now transforming the data flow problem into a graph reachability problem. And we're constructing a so-called exploded supergraph. That must be awesome, right, if it's called exploded supergraph. So we have a special fact, a special bunch of nodes, which are in literature often called lambda facts, right? and they hold everywhere. So everywhere in the program, the lambda fact holds. It's like some special thing to make that whole concept work. And then we just propagate that node through the program, link it all together, right? And then we can do a reachability check for any given statement. So we can check here at this return statement, the node here represents lambda. Um, is it reachable from lambda? Bop, 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 bop. Yeah, it can be reached, yeah. Okay, so this fact holds now. And then you also, in, in the same manner, you encode your other pieces of information you're interested in, really. So for the variable x, you would also just generate a new node and make it reachable from lambda by just drawing an edge. And as if that wouldn't be awesome enough, what you can now do in IDE, you can also use the edges, and you can perform computations on those edges, and you can use those computations in, in lambda calculus. So using lambda functions, you would now uh, be able to specify computations or modifications made to your variables. And here we are just saying, OK, we have that constant lambda function, which always returns 42 to denote, OK, this variable, I mean, is reachable, so it's constant, and its value would be 42. We continue propagation, and uh, I left out, whoopsie, daisy. I left out all the identity functions here for the most bits and pieces. And we also have some, um, we also have some um, further modifications here. So the 9001, we would also, the addition we would also add as a lambda function. 
And uh, here's the uh, plus 9001 in the other branch, we would also model as a lambda function, right? So the same we would do for y, and then continue propagation. And then we are done. And if you now wish to kind of obtain access value at the return statement here, we would just conduct a reachability check. So we would now go to the node in the graph, which, um, in the, or which represents x, which would be this one here, and then we do a reachability check. And while performing the reachability check, we just collect all the lambda functions, compose them, potentially also merge them at this merge point, and which gives, you, uh, which gives us an, an expression here that can then be evaluated to the value of 9043. So and then we now access constant and carries this very value. So isn't that cool? And what's even more cool, that is the really fancy part here. Once you analyze the complete procedure, you can build summaries, right? You can just compose everything on the way to this node here, and then you just have one huge function, which is an often called jump function, which describes the whole effects of this pro procedure on the variable x and y and lambda, right? So we can build summaries. That's the ingenious thing here for IDE. So as you saw, it's flow sensitive, it's intra-procedural. We would be able to also propagate across functions. And it's context sensitive, and it's even infinitely context sensitive by design, um, because we build summaries. And once we analyze the, a function, and this function is called again in some different context, we can just plug in the summary and don't need to reanalyze. And all the context sensitive bits and pieces are encoded in those lambda functions. So you can also apply those summaries in every single context. It doesn't really matter, right? Which makes it blazingly fast. So depending on the complexity of your analysis, of course, you can <coughs> do a whole program analysis in minutes if you wish to compute a, a more complicated property. It can also take a few days. So you need to design your analysis in a smart way, right? It's complex. Um, I mean, I just oversimplified here a bit, probably. So the actual implementation is like 3,000 lines of complex, crazy complex C++ code. Um, and it only really works for distributive problems. I don't expect you to know what that means. But what I do say is it, it, yeah, it, it prevents us from analyzing using IDE a certain class of analysis problems. For instance, pointer analysis we cannot solve using IDE. And memory is also a thing if you conduct whole program analyses because the exploded supergraph that is being constructed can get very large. So keep that in mind. And <clears throat> I find that this shows a few things. And so we should probably talk about compiler people and static analysis people because the incentives are different. So on the one hand, we have optimizations. And on, on the other hand, we have mostly bug finding and, and, and stuff like that, right? So what are the different objectives here? So in compiler optimizations, I mean, we all experience long compile times in C++, right? If you need to compile that very large libraries that you're using, have a hard time, right? Should probably become a smoker or something, or at least grab a cup of coffee. So speed is an issue. It must compile fast. And this is why we can't integrate like two heavyweight analyses in the compiler. Also, Compiler analysis must be sound, right? Because you build optimizations based on those static analysis. And so what, what does sound mean? It means like whenever something is unknown, you need to use a safe over approximation. Say you have a function foo, which receives as an, int uh, which receives as an argument a reference to an integer, and then you call that foo function. But for the analysis, the foo function is only available as a declaration, so you really can't see what it does. The analysis has to assume that whatever you pass in is no longer const after that function call when you conduct a constant analysis, say. And also, all the global variables could be potentially modified. So you need to do safe over approximation, <coughs> uh, approximations in order to obtain correct results. For bug finding vulnerability detection, it's a bit different because there the goal is you need to make it precise and inter-procedural to make it precise. And soundness is typically thrown out of the window immediately because when you wish to build a sound inter-procedural analysis, 
you would need to over approximate so much that the results at the end of the day are so imprecise that it, you can't say any you can't say anything really so it could be like the result of a constant propagation would be yeah um, everything is associated with top now so I can't decide statically and that that doesn't help very much right but even if you're unsound and use uh, under approximations, so you just assume, okay, whenever I don't know a function because it's only available as a declaration, um, I just assume it can't do anything bad to my analysis. Um, that's what we do in, in bug finding vulnerability detection. So, um, analysis challenges. Still, it is the internal fight for precise points to information. It all boils down to that thing. Um, <clears throat> It's not distributive, so you can't use IDE or weighted pushdown systems or pushdown systems or whatnot, right? And it will be hugely expensive if we try to compute in a context-sensitive and interprocedural setup, but that is exactly what we would like to have. Um, if you wish to compute that, you would need to use something which is called the cold string approach, which is basically the monotone framework on steroids. So whenever you propagate uh, data flow information into a call target, you attach a call string to it, such that you know once you analyze the callee where to return. Otherwise, you have no clue where to return. You need to return to all possible return sites, which uh, increases in precision and makes the results unusable at the end of the day. So, and uh, yeah, you need that, and that's a problem. And uh, analysis, I mean, point analysis is an undecidable problem, like most other uh, types of analyses. And that's a huge problem, makes it really difficult. And you may wonder, okay, restrict doesn't look too bad after all, right? Because it was exactly introduced for this purpose, at least in some older C specification, it was part of the language. Correct me if I'm wrong here. Um, <clears throat> and the idea was, okay, um, if the compiler can't compute it really, help the compiler. And um, we do some arithmetic here through indirection using pointers, right? And um, what do we do? What do we need to do in the first example? So we, knew, uh, we need to conduct a load, right, and, and store five to variable A. We need another load to store five, uh, six into B. And then B and A could alias. They could point to the same memory location. We can't tell. This, this is why for the addition, we need, once again, to load from A to, have, to be sure to have the correct value before we do our addition and then return the result. And we, we can use, of course, the restrict keyword here to say, okay, those two variables do not alias, and then the compiler can uh, omit the second load of A, basically. And if you have really a program where you have hot loops and, and you have functions like that that you are calling in hot loops, that can make a huge difference. But really be aware that that is also dangerous. I will comment on that later on. So what are further challenges? Scalability of whole program analysis is still an issue. So you can design analyses that, that are able to finish in minutes, even for million line programs, but it, it highly depends on the whole setup and, and what kind of uh, data flow domain you choose and, and, and that you're using to model your facts of interest. So it can also run for a few days if, if you don't be careful. Analysis precision. Noise to useful information ratio. I mean, if you run an analysis over the, uh, at the nightly build and then developers come back to the office next morning and you throw 50,000 potential bugs and vulnerabilities at them that the static analysis found, they are not happy about that. They probably just throw their notebook out of the window and leave the office again. So, uh, or never use that tool again, so uh, that is still an issue. And then complexity, of course. Most problems in static analysis are undecidable, so this is not only hard in theory, it's even harder in practice if you need to implement those concepts because you must craft implementations that are as efficient as possible in order to make the best of those techniques. And for that reason, we started a static analysis project, which is called Phaser. It's uh, on GitHub. Um, go check it out. And uh, in that project, we implemented concepts of static analysis that are too expensive to be integrated into the compiler. So, and don't blame me. I mean, I started developing that framework when I was still learning C++. So some parts look probably very nasty, but we are. Uh, we have grown a user base by now, and we are continuously improving on the project. So if you want to join, just drop me an email. We could probably use your help. But now, uh, now <clears throat> I want to show you 
how to write an LLVM-based analysis. And I want to show you that this is really nothing dangerous here and, and nothing too complicated. Um, let's have a look how you write an analysis pass in LLVM. So we wish to write an analysis that finds all direct function calls to foo a given, given a certain target program. And so an analysis implementation just corresponds to a class implementation. So you implement your class called site finder analysis. This is the name I come up with, I came up with. You use a mix-in pattern to mix in some LLVM infrastructure such that the LLVM analysis infrastructure and optimizer can understand what this class is and is meant to be. But just using the mix-in pattern, that's relatively, relatively easy. And then essentially, you are specifying what your result type is. And since we wish to find all direct function calls to foo, we just have a vector, a set vector of call sites here as a result. And then we have one function that does the analysis. It always has to be named like that, and it always must be static. And it returns our result um, type that we just described here using that using directive. And you obtain, as an analysis writer, you get a reference to the module that you should analyze, and you also get a reference to the uh, module analysis manager. And recall, on one of the last slides, I said, okay, more complex analyses sometimes need additional information from helper analyses. And the module analysis manager is the thing you can ask for additional helper information if you really need them. We don't need them here, so we just ignore that parameter. And yeah, then we just iterate the functions of the module, we iterate their basic blocks, and we iterate their instructions, and we check if the instruction is a call site that calls a function, and if that is a direct function call, and the function that is being called is named foo, then we put it in our result vector and return it at the end of this analysis, right? So only very few lines, very simple. So based on this simple analysis, let's now conduct an optimization that, that uses the information of the analysis pass. And I mean, it's pretty much the same. An optimization in LLVM is just a class implementation. You mix in, again, some information that the LLVM infrastructure provides, and then the optimizer needs to, to understand what you're trying to do here. And then it's only also just an implementation of the run uh, function here, this function always needs to be called run. You get uh, a reference to the module under analysis, and again, you get a reference to the module analysis manager. And this time, we need the module analysis manager, because in order to uh, conduct our transformation here, we need the information from the analysis that we just wrote. So, and we can just ask, yeah, please give me the results of that analysis. And then we get a vector of all those call sites that uh, comprise fu direct function calls to foo. And in our transformation, it's not, not much of an optimization, but it's a transformation in any way. Uh, anyways, um, we try to replace those function calls to foo with function calls to bar. So let's do that. Let's apply the transformation. So we just iterate all the call site, uh, sites that the analysis found, and then we can use the LLVM API to generate new intermediate representation. So we can now also use code generation. So we can ask LLVM, LLVM constant int dot dot get, colon colon get, and that is, uh, that is a factory function, which now produces a new um, constant integer, which we initialize with the replacement counter, which sits at one at the beginning. Right? And we also say, okay, we wish to have that integer uh, of a 32-bit size. And since we also pass as a parameter the context, the lifetime and all that memory management that you don't really wish to do, uh, that is handled by the LLVM context, as, as I mentioned earlier. Then we also create, and create is also a factory function, we create the new call site, which calls to the replacement function bar, and as a parameter, we give to that bar function the constant integer that we just created. So we have a function called bar, and then it receives a literal here, in that case, namely the replacement counter transitively. And then we can use it and replace the old call site by the new call site that we just constructed, and then increment the replacement counter. So that each call site gets a 
an, um, an incremented counter, really. And then at the very end, we need to return something, and we need to return the preserved analyses, because a transformation pass modifies IR. We need to tell the pass manager that calls us later on uh, what we modified and what analyses that may run previously we just broke, right? So you can now in detail specify what um, other analyses may need to be recomputed because you just heavily modified the IR, right? Here we are lazy, we are just uh, said, um, okay, I'm modifying everything, so please do recompute everything. And then it's up to the um, optimizer infrastructure to schedule like what happens in a sensible manner, right? That is also a hard problem in compilers, but I won't go into detail here. So now we can put the pieces together. I mean, that is pretty much the same left-hand side as before. So we just pass the module that we wish to modify. Then we set up a bit of pass infrastructure, right? So pass builder, module analysis manager, we register our analysis. And then uh, we uh, register our transformation pass, the call site replacer. Maybe it's also a good idea to add a verifier at the very end, just to make sure that we didn't mess up anything. And then we can apply it and run that infrastructure on our target module. And then we can just print the modified module to the command line, for instance, just to showcase how it could be done. All right. So do developers really know better than the compiler? We also want to talk about that. <sighs> Unfortunately, at some point, the compiler could need your help, as the restrict keyword show, show us here. So, yeah, because we are lacking in compilers at least. I mean, in theory, you can have your own very precise pointer analyses, which are very expensive, but can't be integrated into the compiler. But what the compiler currently provides is uh, not very good. So you are lacking precise points information, and especially you're lacking inter-procedural points information, which led to this restrict keyword here. And this would be the assembly that is generated and as I promised before, you really save a load here. And um, yeah, you don't need to reload from A. Uh, but as always, I mean, if you lie to the compiler and you pass in something that actually does alias, the code is just wrong, right? So you need to be very careful if you really have to use it. Um, yeah, measure it if it makes sense. But, uh, and you may say, OK, a restrict is not a C++ keyword, uh, at least not an official one. Yeah, but compiler writers don't care, right? You have all your. Uh, fancy compiler internal keywords, <laughs> underscore, underscore, and then all, all things blow up uh, that you can use here instead, right? So every compiler I know implements that. Uh, const expression, does it help? Um, so let's have a look. Let's just have a normal version of the factorial function and then just call it with an uh, integer literal here. And the LLVM IR that is generated is the following. So we have code for the factorial function and then the function call in main is optimized. So you don't need const expr in that, in that case. And also, even before const expr existed, compilers did that, right? So it's nothing like, oh, yeah, we, we turn the whole world over and now everything is better. So it, it worked previously. Um, it's more or a kind of thing of expressing intent, right? So to, to, to tell other developers what your code is supposed to be or can potentially do. Um, there's another case where you can, where you can see what, 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 what the compiler may do if you uh, say something uh, is in a const extra function. So let's have this case here. And if you have the const expert version of the program, it will produce you the main, and it will return the result directly, and it will completely eliminate the factorial definition. Because in order to be used as a const expert function, the function definition has to be available in the module that you, are, you, that you wish to use it in, right? So that factorial function cannot be used in any other module, and the compiler here was smart enough to figure out that this was the only call site here, and it's no, needed, uh, it's no longer needed for any other call site, or uh, say, uh, let alone another module, so it can be completely eliminated and makes the code a bit smaller, more compact, compact. Of course, if you start messing around with function pointers or so, right, or similar things, compiler uh, may not be able to do that. Right, so keep that in mind. But potentially, it gives new opportunities for optimizations. 
No except, same thing. If the compiler can see your code and if the information that need to be computed are not too complex such that it can't do it, it automatically knows if your function throws or doesn't throw, so why using no except? Again, it's for expressing intent, right? So in the ordinary case, in the good old times, you would write code like that, for instance. And let's assume we only know about the declarations of foo and bar. We don't know their definitions. And if you look at the corresponding LLVM intermediate representation, you see that the compiler needs to invoke every function call in, in the try block. What is invoke? Invoke is similar to a call, ordinary LLVM IR call instruction, with the only difference being you have an exception handler attached to it, right? So you have your, your ordinary destination where you would continue if, if that function that is being called, like foo, for instance, if that is executed normally and you don't have the exceptional case, you would continue at the invoke continue label. And if that function throws, you go to the unwind, this unwind label here, which is the percent %l pad here, that's just the name for the basic block which is then executed, which contains the exception handler. Same holds for the bar function, right? Could potentially throw, so we need to invoke it and also uh, at the exception handler. So, but uh, you can also say no except, um, even though the function may throw, of course, then uh, just still terminate is, is being called, right? So when termination is an acceptable response, you can also just add the no except keyword, right? And it, it may help the compiler to kind of like, op I mean, it gives room for internal optimizations, I should say. Right. Same situation here, so we only have declarations of foo and bar, and on the left-hand side we have the same usage pattern, so we still are calling foo and bar in the try block. And the LLVM IR now looks as follows. So the foo function may throw, I mean, we don't know, the compiler doesn't know because we don't know its definition, so it still needs to be invoked. Bar, on the other hand, is marked as no except, so, and here you can really see it's just only called, so no exception handler is registered or whatnot, right? And if you, again, if you lie to the compiler, still terminate is being called, and then, yeah, I mean, it's your business, right? Uh, it's end of the game. So it gives opportunities to the compiler, and also it's like for expressing intent. So let's like draw some first conclusions here. Static analysis is pretty cool, and compilers are awesome, I'd say. So, and compilers, as you saw, heavily rely on static analysis information. But some tasks are statically undecidable. And unfortunately, any interesting general program analysis is undecidable. But, I mean, we should still do it, right? We can still compute lots of useful information that the compiler then can uh, use to conduct um, optimizations, or we can use for bug finding vulnerability detection. So uh, now how static analysis works and write your code accordingly. So do now what it means if you have procedure boundaries at certain points in the program. Do now the impl implications um, that using pointers and global variables yeah, bring with them. So do now what, what an analysis can compute for you and what it can't uh, do for you. And then help the compiler to figure it out by writing code that expresses intent. Right, that's, that's the best advice I can give. So uh, an example here, uh, I teach a C++ course as well at, at uh, Paderborn University, and um, there's a project at the end of the semester, and one tiny bit of the algorithm that the students need to implement is finding the maximum of four values, right? And as it turns out, you can do that in multiple different ways. So I see code like that from the students, which is, uh, yeah, I mean, it does what it does, right? But uh, yeah, it's also crazy. Then you have the most efficient solution, right? So you can get away with just uh, three comparisons. That's also perfectly fine. And then you can just be lazy and crawl to the standard STL library, right, algorithm. And um, so now let's have a look at the assembly, actually. So this is O2 optimized with the most recent Clang. So, I mean, even <laughs> for the left inside the compiler, even the optimizer couldn't figure it out and just generated like some 28 lines of assembly, uh, which do many unnecessary things. And um, for the code in the middle, so the max smart implementation and the max lazy implementation, this is the assembly being generated. 
So sometimes it's also okay to be lazy, to, be, to just express what you want your program to do, such that the uh, compiler optimizer can see through it, and so you don't uh, need to be necessarily smart. So uh, to conclude, uh, keep in mind how static analysis works. Now its limits, now what it can compute, and now the things it has trouble with, such that you can write code that aids the uh, static analysis and the compiler, such that it can produce the kind of optimal code, really, right? So also don't be naive, but also don't be smart. So somewhere in the middle ground is a good thing, uh, I'd say. And if you're interested in static analysis and those kind of things, uh, talk to us. I mean, I already talked about the phaser project where we implement stuff that's too expensive to be put into the compiler. We really need your help, right? It's crazy complicated, right? And the more people we can get on board and have interest, uh, interested in those kind of things, the better. So just drop me an email if you're interested. And otherwise, I don't know, I am happy to take any questions or I stick around for a few more minutes. <laughs> um, first of all, thanks for, for the talk. Um, you mentioned in your talk about uh, the problem with scalability and I would like to know what's the bottleneck there. And you also mentioned about memory. I uh, would like to know what's the problem. Is it density? It is irregular accesses? It is low operational intensities? Yeah, that's. Yeah. Um, scalability, the worst case runtime of the IDE algorithm is uh, n times d squared, where n is the set of instructions of your program that you wish to analyze, and d is the domain of the data flow facts. And it's cubed the domain of the data flow facts. That what, in essence, what that tells you is the more data flow facts you need to create while conducting an analysis, the slower it gets. And if you design your domains in a clever way, you don't need to generate very many data flow facts, and then you can have really fast analyses, right? But if you need an analysis that is also, let's say, uh, field sensitive and can distinguish individual fields, <clears throat> you typically need to generate much more data flow facts and then it falls apart at some point, right? That's the main issue. And, and still, um, if you wish to have a precise analysis, you also need pointer information to resolve like indirect calls to build a precise call graph, right? That's also a huge pain point. And then um, in terms of space, yeah, space of the exploded supergraph for the IDE algorithm, for instance, is n times, um, n times d. As simple as that. That is the maximum number of data flow facts generated times the instructions of your program. And this can also like blow up. And it really heavily depends on how do, you, how do you design your data flow facts? How do they look like? How many of them do you have to generate? So there are lots and lots of design decisions that you can make and you need to be aware what kind of consequences those decisions have. I hope that answers your question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm still around for Hello. a bit. Um, yeah, thanks for the talk. I wanted to mess with it, and this is very you know, <laughs> timely. Uh, so my question is, um, when you do optimizations, obviously it matters which hardware you target. And often there is like, you know, as far as I know, there is, after the LLVM, there is a native pass. Exactly. But, um, like, the native, uh, the, you often need to, like, let's say you unroll loops. Like, depending on the hardware you target, you will unroll loops differently. Exactly. So, uh, yeah. How does, so what kind of information does the IR generation know about the specific hardware it takes? Or Nothing at all. So IR, LLVM IR is just really an intermediate representation that some f or the majority of analyses and optimizations are performed on. And then, as you are mentioning correctly, when the actual machine code is generated from the then optimized IR, further optimizations may be applied that require information on specific hardware. And those kinds of information are really like oftentimes hard coded, right? So what kind of loop unrolling should be done for what kind of architecture and so on. That's a whole different story, really complex. But, uh, okay, so if you take 
which algorithm, I don't remember, but like, there is an algorithm that uh, if you flip certain switches, will be vectorized, and you don't flip the switches, you don't get vectorization. Yeah. That obviously needs to know about the switch. So is it done after they are generation then? Yes. Awful. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the talk. Um, I have a few questions from our online audience. Um, first of all, Daniel Demidov, and I'm very sorry if I butchered the name, uh, asked, uh, how stable is LLVM's API? Does it change much or often? Mm, it changes from major release to major release, but only typically at very small places. So whenever you have a bunch of analyses up your sleeve, you already implemented them, and then you upgrade your LLVM, Typically, there are only a few minor places where you need to like replace one function call by a different one, um, but it's, it's not that frightening, so it's all manageable. Yeah. Thank you. Um, another question by the same questioner is, does functional error handling, so is it expected, um, or versus exceptions make optimizations analysis harder or easier? Um, I'd say to the compiler, it doesn't matter much. It, it, it really doesn't matter much. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, it's all translated. I mean, in C++, all, you have always those crazy syntaxes, right? And then, but first of all, LLVM IR is produced, which is much simpler looking. And then it really doesn't matter what kind of concept you use. It typically even boils down to the same IR, and then the analyses do their magic, the best thing to compute useful information. Thanks. Uh, and one last question by Julian Kent. And sorry again if I'm messed up the name. Uh, what are some examples of analysis that would be viable if we gave double or 10 times the computational budget to compiler? Uh, pardon me once again? Um, what are some examples of analysis that would be viable if we gave double or maybe 10 times the computational budget to compiler? Uh, yeah, that, that would be definitely uh, points to analysis. Then you would finally be able to put precise points to analysis into your compiler. Currently, uh, I mean, LLVM, most, for the most part, at least, assumes your pointer information is rubbish anyways. So, but uh, that could be improved, and I talked to compiler engineers from a major company, which I don't know if I can mention the name right here. But anyhow, um, they estimated that an improvement in points to analysis, points to information, could speed up all of their applications across the whole company from 1 to 10%. And even 1% would, I mean, that would save the salary costs of, for, for thousands of programmers and, and software engineers, probably. So, yeah, there's lots in it, but, I, I mean, it's complicated. And at, at the end of the day, it's an undecidable problem. So we have to work around and be smart about it. Yeah. All right, thank you. Welcome, yeah. So I've got, um, yeah, thanks for the talk. Um, so passing by ref, Reference is effectively the same as passing by pointer. Yes. Yeah. So if you pass by const ref, then you run into all the issues that you have about like potentially aliasing. Yeah. So is it then in principle better to pass by value and move into the value? Is, it, is, is, is that actually going to be, if, if you, you want to help the compiler, is that a good idea? idea? Um, first of all, the compiler doesn't really care about const. I mean, that's only for, to protect developers because the compiler always has to assume you can con const cast it away somewhere. So yeah, um, in some places, it's if I mean, if the object that you try to pass into a function is small, you should really do it by uh, value such that the compiler can like forget about points to information that, that really can make a difference. I don't have a good example here uh, up my sleeve, but maybe I could craft something. Right, um, yeah, that, that, that is definitely a thing. Um, moving stuff around, then move constructors are being used, right? And in move constructors, what do you do for the most part? You are like pointing to now different things and then it's the same story. So you can't really get away with that. Thank you. All right, if there are no more questions, I think we are done. Have a good time.